Hello, I'm Faith Rogers, host of today's program, COVID-19, Keeping Up with the Moving Target. Thank you for joining us. This activity is jointly provided by the Postgraduate Institute for Medicine, DKB Med, and the Institute for Johns Hopkins Nursing. Today's program is accredited for ANCC, AAPA, and AMA PRA Category 1 credits. Please visit our website for complete CE information. If you're tuning into our webcast, please click the Claim Credit button on the webinar console. Otherwise, please go to covid19.dkbmed.com, navigate to our multi-specialty episodes, and select the webinar to claim credit. Today's learning objective is to describe the reliability of available rapid antigen tests with currently circulating variants. This educational activity is supported by independent medical educational grants from Gilead Sciences Incorporated, as well as in-kind support from DKB Med. With us today, we have Dr. Paul Allwater, Clinical Director of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He will be interviewing Dr. Yuka Manabe, a Professor of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases, the Medical Director of the John G. Bartlett Specialty Practice, and the Director for Center for Innovative Diagnostics for Infectious Diseases. They will be discussing COVID-19 testing. Dr. Manabe, Dr. Allwater, thank you so much for both of your times today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, Faith, and uh, I'm delighted to have Dr. Yuka Minabi here today, who has been so helpful uh, within our own ID community and the Johns Hopkins Health System in uh, gaining better understanding and advances uh, with uh, viral diagnostics with the uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. So thank you, Yuka, for joining. My uh, pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I think for many um, patients often have questions about reliability of tests. I remember early on when we only had molecular testing that got off to a rough start in the US. And then, you know, we talked about a false negative rate based on sample collections and so on. And now we have antigen tests. Many people have them uh, at home now and uh, maybe deciding one or the other. They obviously each have their merits, but um, I just thought if we could just talk about the accuracy of these tests, and, and especially with uh, a new variant like Omicron, I mean, is that something we should worry about? And maybe we could start off with just the molecular uh, diagnostics, which I, we've really come to rely on as a gold standard. So as you know, most molecular diagnostics uh, happen in reference labs. They are the most sensitive kind of test that we have. Uh, but even with these most sensitive tests, there can be false negatives. So there are people who may require more than one test to verify whether or not they had uh, COVID-19. So that's the first thing to remember. Lateral flow or rapid tests that we call now are less sensitive, but they tend to find the people who have the most burden of infection, the ones that are most likely to transmit to others. And when you have symptoms can be quite sensitive. So they're quite good for people who are symptomatic. In the asymptomatic phase, when you might be building up an infection, um, it might be less good. And so a molecular test would be better in that particular time. So it's important to think about before you have symptoms and during symptoms, when you think about what test. The second thing that's really important is which one's available to you. So it's nice to talk about molecular tests and rapid tests, but if you don't have those available to you, then it's not really part of your, um, a way for you to figure out what your status is. So with molecular tests, because they go to a reference lab and a whole bunch of them could get done at one time, uh, they tend to uh, have, you, they're more scalable. So we can do thousands of tests, uh, even in a day at certain facilities. Whereas, as you know, a rapid test, though fast, 15 minutes, you get a result, you only get one result. So it depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you're screening a whole classroom, uh, it may not be very good to do rapid tests. So the second one is, so one is uh, speed, another one is availability, and then uh, this one has to do with scale, like how many you want to do at once. So there are different considerations. I think most of us think we're an individual, we're not thinking about public health, but if we had a public health eye, we might choose differently than if we were just thinking about our own testing. Yeah, I think you make some excellent points. And even on a practical basis, uh, one, one overarching concept here in March of 2020 is Maryland now has among the lowest rates of uh, parent 
uh, active SARS-CoV-2 infection in our communities. And uh, how do you, how does that play into the uh, reliability uh, of either the molecular or the antigen tests as, as rates fall and perhaps we have more influenza or other viruses circulating? So as rates fall, the likelihood of having a false positive test increases. And that's just the reality. During Omicron, when there was a huge number of cases in late December, early January, if you had a positive test, it probably really was positive because there was so much of it circulating. As we have less and less COVID circulating, I think uh, you might want to verify. So for example, let's say we come to a time where we can test and treat because we're starting to get more oral therapies, say, for, um, for COVID. Um, a single antigen test may be worth verifying with a second antigen test or to do a molecular test before you get treatment. And that's because there are always side effects to treatment and you wanna make sure that you're the person that needs to be treated. Um, so uh, I think that rapid tests are great because they're rapid. And if you have a huge amount of virus, even if you don't yet have symptoms, you might be able to know that you're positive and not go visit someone, for example, who might be at risk for having bad complications of COVID. So um, I feel like we're moving around in terms of topics, but I think that uh, you really have to think about how much COVID is around when you're using tests, particularly the rapid antigen tests. When there's a lot around, it's probably, if a positive, it's probably a real positive. If there's not much around and you have a positive, you might be a little more suspicious that you could be a false positive. Yeah, it does get a little more complex. And I I'd have to say for the patients I most worry about, I'd love to have a quick diagnosis because as you mentioned, I might refer them for uh, monoclonal antibodies or potentially uh, some of the oral antivirals that are now available. Uh, so uh, coming back to just one other aspect, um, there have been some occasional reports of some platforms not working well with variants, but on the whole, I've been impressed that at least both the antigen and most of the molecular platforms have performed well uh, in this case, despite mutational changes. Is, is that your view? That is my view. And I think this is an area where you can know that the Food and Drug Administration has done a good job. They care deeply about making sure that the tests that we have will detect the variants that are circulating. And so there have been a few um, reports that they have put out warning users about tests that may not be picking up variants of concern that are currently circulating. For the lateral flow tests, by and large, um, they've been about the same amount of sensitivity um, with different variants. But there are uh, some tests that don't perform as well, but you can be sure that the Food and Drug Administration will let you know. And in fact, there are a couple that were recalled when they found that they were either having a high false positivity rate or that they were relatively insensitive with that variant. Um, for molecular tests, they can actually look at all the genes and they can look at the coding of those genes and they can know whether or not the way that they are detecting the virus will work or not work. So you can actually do that on a computer. You don't have to go and test them in a lab. That's what they call in silico. So I can look on a computer and figure out whether or not the targets are gonna be found. So the, for the molecular tests, that is done routinely every time there are new variants circulating, even at low level, and there will soon be a quick warning if it's not going to be good. So I think here, this is where the Food and Drug Administration has done a very good job trying to stay on top of things. So right now, unless a warning has gone out, you can know that they generally have the same sensitivity as they've had in the past. And, and that's excellent news about the molecular platforms. And, and for the antigen tests, uh, of course, all the a lot of the mutational pressures on the spike protein, but my understanding is the antigen tests actually uh, look for the nucleoprotein, a different one, which may have some mutations, but not nearly uh, the pressure that we tend to have seen so far with the spike. So that's, that's exactly right, Paul. So um, as you know, uh, we've all seen a million pictures of the coronavirus of SARS-CoV-2. And so those spikes that are coming out are usually not the target. There's only one antigen test that I know of, and it's actually a mixed spike plus nucleocapsid. Nucleocapsid is actually inside of the virus. So when you're putting that swab in your nose and you're putting it inside that buffer, it usually has a light detergent in there to open up the virus, to let out that nucleocapsid protein. 
there have been some mutations and in fact, some deletions, but it's not changed the way that the antibody is recognizing that protein nucleocapsid. So the sensitivity has been about the same. Yuka, from your perspective as a diagnostic expert, I was wondering if you could give me and some of our viewers a sense of whether there's uh, significant differences in some of the sampling techniques that evolved from the original posterior nasopharyngeal swab that we have been doing for molecular testing. Uh, the things that I've seen are uh, 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 nostril or nary swabs, I've seen oral swabs, I've seen saliva tests. Um, what's your perspective on some of these uh, alternate methods? So um, speaking generally, the best sample type is the one that you're willing to get again. And that's because we've been living with COVID now for two plus years. And if you get one test and you're never willing to do it again, um, I think that's probably not a good test for you. So that's one. Two, all tests have been approved based on the sample type. So you can look in the package insert and it will tell you what sample types it's been approved to be used for. And that's important because that's the data on which it got approved. So you could try a different sample type, but there's no assurance that you using a different sample type will work the same with that test. So that's, that's the second important thing. Um, if you wanna sort of step back a little and think a little bit more scientifically about it, um, samples that come from the back and the nasopharynx probably have the best sensitivity because there's a lot of virus back there. Um, as you move forward in the nose, we find that it's less sensitive, but we all know that getting a nasal swab is a lot easier than getting a nasopharyngeal swab, which goes way back and can sometimes be uncomfortable, especially if it's done improperly. And so we've all heard stories, um, and there's certainly been in the media, of people uh, getting very uncomfortable nasopharyngeal swabs. So um, again, the best test is the one that you're willing to get again. So the ones that are kind of in the middle or in the front, you might consider blowing your nose first. I always tell people there's a few sample kits that say blow your nose first because you might wanna bring what's something in the back towards the front and you're still using the test properly. There was a time during Omicron where everyone said swab your throat. Well, that might make sense. It made sense because sometimes the virus can be back there, but that's also not the sample type that was approved with that kit. So um, one thing that has been interesting though, I do think that the saliva sample type is a very good one um, for surveillance. And that's because there have been several studies to show that sometimes the saliva might go positive a few days earlier than a nasopharyngeal swab. So if you're doing molecular testing and you're doing a molecular test that's been approved on saliva, that's been a very nice way to surveil. So as you know, at Johns Hopkins, that's what we use to surveil and staff. And that's been very useful because you might find people early in infection before they have a chance to transmit it to others. So um, that's one uh, perhaps nuance that might be interesting. But in general, people don't give salivary samples. They tend to get, that's like spit that you've allowed to sort of pool in your mouth and you put it into a cup. Um, most people are doing nasal swabs. Yeah, and Yuka, speaking of the um, reliability of these tests, uh, most have been approved on a rather limited data set under emergency use authorization by the FDA. And of course, mm -hmm. we're, and I'm sure you're familiar and many of us with FDA approval of these tests. Are these moving ahead? Or are we going to see um, these uh, approved so they can be used um, even when the public health emergency might uh, not be declared? I, I worry a little bit because technically we're not supposed to use anything under emergency use if the public health emergency is uh, done away with. So that's a really interesting point. Very few have moved on to what we call 510K clearance. And so that would be a full on clinical study that was large enough that they would give full clearance at any time, not during, uh, not as the um, emergency use authorized ones are. So for right now, um, they are gonna give some lead time to companies to tell them, to warn them. I think the difficult thing is to get enough people between now and then, given the low rates of COVID, might be more difficult for people to achieve 510K clearance. What a lot of companies are doing now is what we call multiplex. They're thinking into the future and we don't just care about COVID, we care about, I have a respiratory syndrome. It could be COVID, it could be influenza, it could be RSV. And so um, what I'm seeing is many companies moving multiplex tests 
tests that look for more than one thing forward to try to get 510k clearance. So that way, what they're getting approved with the best kind of approval, which would be useful even during not a, a public health emergency, would have all of the things that we worry about, or at least the treatable ones in that uh, combination test. And that's what I'm seeing. So a lot of people are moving forward with 510k clearance or this FDA category for, um, for uh, a combination kind of test. And I yeah. think that makes a lot of sense because I think that's the next era when uh, we find that COVID is endemic. We see it, we'll see it every season. Uh, and maybe we'll see it in the off season too. I think we have yet to figure that out. But as that moves forward, we are gonna wanna know um, was it influenza? And as you know, during Omicron period, an interesting thing happened. We had a lot of influenza and then Omicron happened and the amount of influenza went to almost zero. So it really outcompeted all the other respiratory viruses. That or people went and put their masks back on. And so those viruses weren't transmitting as much. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Those are great insights. Uh, last topic, um, a complex one, but perhaps uh, one or two points serology. Um, you know, what, what do you find might be the practical role? People ask me, what level gives me protection? And I've commented that I know when you have very low or no antibodies, I'm very worried. So that's where we might use Evisheld and, and these sorts of things. Do you really see uh, a routine use for serology or is it just uh, adequate to know at this point people's underlying health problems and anticipating who might not respond well to the vaccine and so on. I think that you've outlined the most important use case, which is if you don't have a very good B cell response, you don't have good humoral immunity, you're not making good antibody. We wanna know that because those people can have persistent virus. They just don't clear. They don't clear because they don't have the right response to clear. So that's the most important use case in my mind. Unfortunately, we've never been able to show, you can show roughly that people who have a really high antibody response tend to have the best neutralizing immune response. But when we me measure a serology, we're not measuring the neutralizing immune response, the true protective response. And that's really just a rough correlation. Um, it, it's not, you know, it's not in the high nineties as we would hope. So we don't have a good easy to measure correlate of the people who really have good neutralizing immunity. So I don't see that many uses for it. There might be times where you have somebody and you wanna confirm that they had infections, say they're having a big inflammatory response, they're still in the hospital, they never had a positive test, and you wanted to know whether they were really exposed and infected with SARS-CoV-2, then a serology might be useful. And in fact, I think the Infectious Disease Society of America has put that in its guidelines and then the use case that you put out. The other thing that's hard is how long these antibody responses stay in a person is unclear. So even for population surveillance, like wanting to know what proportion of the population has been exposed to COVID, it's not that reliable. Um, and so uh, I think that the use cases even for that are sort of limited. And, and we also have to be aware a little bit about which test we're ordering, the spike antibody test or the nucleoprotein. Someone's been immunized, a recent infection, of course, the nucleoprotein is probably the uh, antibody test you'd like, but that does wane a, uh, faster. So I know my patients that are wondering, oh, do I have long haul COVID six months, eight months, nine months later, uh, that's no longer really a, a reliable test. That's exactly right. And so remember the anti-spike is what you're gonna get if you were vaccinated. So um, I think if you wanted to know that you had a productive response to the to the, the vaccine, you could, but it no longer helps you differentiate people who are vaccinated versus those that were naturally infected. Exactly. Yuka, thank you so much. I mean, we've, we've hit molecular antigen tests, some trends, serology, all in just a, a few minutes. I really wanna thank you for your, lending your expertise and uh, the information here that hopefully will help um, our uh, patients. Um, and uh, stay tuned for the second part of our uh, COVID-19 diagnostics program. Well, thank you again to both of you for your time. We certainly do appreciate it. If you're tuning into our webcast, please click the claim credit button in the webinar console to attest for credit. Otherwise, please visit us at covid19.dkbmed.com. Again, thank you for joining us and thank you for your dedication to your patients with COVID-19.